Go ahead, Janet. Hello. Yeah. Um, today is the licensing reg committee. Um, we've got apologies from Councillor Ryan, Shukat and Sweeney. Um, we've got people in the um, what's known as a waiting room. Um, uh, the, the objectors and the solicitors and the um, appellant, they'll be invited through by themselves um, as and when the need arises. Okay, just be mindful that we everything that's said can be heard in the chat rooms. Um, and can, if you want to do a chat or, or you see something that, that you need to bring to attention, use the chat um, function. Okay, thank you very much for that, Janet, and welcome everybody to this um, first licensing committee uh, under new circumstances. Um, it's good to see many of you. Um, it's been a while since we've seen each other in person. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'll go through the I'll go through the agenda. It's a one it's a one item agenda today, as you're aware, members. Um, if members have any interest, please declare them uh, now or, or as they come up. Um, I can't um, necessarily see everybody at the same time, so if you wave your hand and I don't see you, um, if uh, one of one of the team would just flag that up with me, I'd really appreciate that. Um, and um, they're in charge of mics too. <laughs> they're keeping. They're going to keep us all in check. So that's really helpful. Um, the uh, it's not proposed that people be excluded from the meeting. We've got people um, uh, within within this uh, Zoom within this Zoom call or or panelists and uh, the applicant and people who are going to uh, speak uh, in objection. We're also live on live on YouTube. Um, minutes of the meeting held on the fifteenth uh, of January. Um, any comments or can I get a, a mover and seconder to approve them? Uh, more with Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pillai. Yeah, happy to second, Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll take that, unless you've got a, a Councillor Carter, have you got a, a question or comment? You just unmuted, Councillor Carter. Uh, just a quick comment, Chair. There are a lot of things in that that we're, we're going to get progressed further down the line. Um, obviously, with the circumstances being as they are, do we know, have we any idea how we're going to achieve some of that? We, do, we just had a, a brief discussion about the fact that this is this is currently delayed because of what's going on and there isn't um, a, any new update on what that timeline likely is going to be, but there is going to be some time to have to catch up. I don't know if Fiona wants to add anything or if you feel I've covered that there. I'll tell you that was covered then. Okay. Um, I, I will, we'll try and get something out to you, Councillor Carr, once, once, once we know what, what's going to happen with that uh, with that review. Um, but if you've got any further questions, let, let me off Fiona know and we can, we can try and take those on. Is that okay? Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. I'll take those as approved. We've also got a, um, a subcommittee meeting. Um, if we've got no co comments on that, I was present, so I'll move those. Um, Second that, Chair. All right, thank you, Eli. Okay, I'll uh, move those as a correct record. All those in favor? We need to, uh, let, let's practice the voting on this one. If we can see people. Yes, agreed. Yeah, thank you. All right, best of a test run. Um, okay, and a nice easy one. Right. Um, okay, I'll, uh, our main item today is the application for the renewal of a um, sexual entertainment venue, namely the Salsa. This is an application that many of you will have um, sat through in previous years. Um, and I'm going to um, firstly hand over to Fiona, who's going to, uh, going to give us an update. Um, and speak to the report, um, answer some questions that have been put in, and thank you to objectors who have put in questions in advance. It has helped in um, getting a more full answer. Um, then I'll invite members uh, to ask any questions or comments, um, and then I will invite uh, the objectors and then finally the applicant to present to the committee. Um, okay, so we'll start off with you, Fiona, if you're ready. Yes, thank you, Chair. 
Um, so today, members are asked to determine the application for the renewal of a sexual entertainment venue licence where objections have been received. The application is in respect of a premises known as La Salsa. The Home Office guidance, which is shown at Appendix 4 of your pack, states that objections should not be based on moral grounds or values, and local authorities should not consider objections that are not relevant to the mandatory and the discretionary grounds. The Council's Statement of Licensing Policy provides guidance on the grounds for refusal. They are both mandatory grounds and discretionary. The mandatory grounds are applicants, applications for sex establishments must be refused on the following, following mandatory grounds. If the applicant is under 18, if the applicant has been dis, uh, disqualification following the revocation of their license, if the applicant is a non-resident in the UK, um, if it's a company not incorporated in the UK or a previous refusal of the applicant in the previous 12 months. The discretionary grounds for refusal are if the applicant is unsuitable to hold a licence by reason of having been convicted of an offence or for any other reasons that would provide us by provided to us by West Yorkshire Police as the responsible authority. If the business would be managed by or carried on for the benefit of third party who would be refused, a license in their own right, that the number of sex establishments in the locality or of the particular kind in the locality equals or exceeds the number considered to be appropriate, is inappropriate having to regard to the character of the relevant locality, the use of the premises in the vicinity, the layout, the character, the conditions or location of the premises. A decision must be relevant to one or more of the grounds and reasons must be given for the decision. The council's statement of licensing policy limits our number of sex establishments within Calderdale as a whole to one. This renewal would not see this increase in the number of sex establishments in Calderdale. The application has not attracted an objection from West Yorkshire Police. And for information uh, that from the last uh, known knowledge was that Women's Centre opens Monday to Friday, nine to five, um, and they occasionally have tea time appointments um, and it opened in its current location in June 2003. La Salsa's opening hours are 5 till 5, 5 p.m. till 5.30 a.m. the following morning, Monday to Sunday. However, we've written confirmation that the usual opening time is around 8 p.m. On, on special dates such as New Year's Eve or if they're having a party booking, they may open slightly earlier. Um, and La Salso first opened at the beginning of 2003. Members should also have been circulated the case summary for the applicant prior to the meeting today, just for ease so that they, um, they can have a chance to, to read and digest the information. Therefore, members can grant the license as applied for, or grant the license with additional conditions, or refuse the license. So it's a matter for members. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on to the questions that have been posed to the authority prior to the meeting with the response that we have for them, if that's okay. So the first question is, do the committee feel that the presence of a sexual entertainment venue, the purpose of which is provided principally for the purposes of sexually stimulating any member of an audience, as mentioned in the letter of objection, and in the standard conditions for sexual entertainment venues in the centre of Halifax, directly opposite Women's Centre, is safe and appropriate? The response would be, this is not really a relevant consideration for members. La Salsa opened in its current location at the beginning of 2003, and the Women's Centre opened in its current location in June 2003. It has been deemed an acceptable site for 16 years. Members are required to consider any changes in locality following the last renewal which is an annual thing. The second question is, is the committee aware that lap dancing clubs have been associated with money laundering and trafficking referenced in my letter of objection? Again, this is not really a relevant consideration for members. There's no evidence that this premises is associated with any illegal activities. And I can confirm again that West Yorkshire Police have not submitted an objection to the application. The third question is, the regulations state, paragraph 12, of section 3, that a license may be refused where the applicant is unsuitable to hold a license by reason of having been convicted of an offence for any other reason or any other reason. 
the applicant has 117,000 pounds seized under the Proceeds of Crime Act. This was denied at previous committee meetings and it was stated that the, that the Asian Times report of this was false. My letter includes a confirmation from the Police Crime Commissioner's Office that the report was correct. Do the committee think this applicant, this applicant is therefore suitable to hold a license in an industry with so many opportunities? Members have been circulated a copy of the applicant's DBS prior to the committee meeting, which confirms the applicant has no convictions. And that's the response to that question. Um, the fourth question is, is the council confident that the renewal of the license is compliant with its licensing of sex establishment venue statement of licensing policy? I will refer to my letter dated November 28th, 2019. So the letter objection refers to the premises being in the vicinity of Halifax Central Church and Ebenezer Church. This is not a change in the locality since the last renewal. The letter also refers to being in the vicinity of a premises used for schools, children's nurseries, youth clubs, children's centres, toy shops or similar establishments, which children under 18 may reasonably be expected to attend. And the premises also in the vicinity that are used for the community facilities, including but not limited to swimming pools, leisure centres, public parks, libraries, sheltered housing and accommodation for vulnerable people. Because young women and girls regularly attend the women's centre, some of whom are extremely vulnerable. As stated in the opening remarks, La Salle has been operating in its current location since the beginning of 2003. And the women's centre has been open since June 2003. In its current location, previously, the hours of opening La Salle were amended so that it does now not open at the same time as the women's centre. Because this is an application for the renewal of a sexual entertainment venue license, and while it is necessary to demonstrate that something has changed since the decision granting the license, due regard must be given to the fact that a license was previously granted. If there is no relevant change in circumstances, the committee must give reasons for de departing from the earlier decision. Question five. Has the council undertaken any licensing compliance checks on the establishment? Please provide any relevant evidence. I will refer to my letter dated November 28, 2019. In response is, I can confirm that last enforcement check on the premises was 15th of November, 2019. Uh, there were no compliance issues following this inspection by the community safety enforcement officers. The policy has committed to five annual inspections and we will carry out these inspections however this year we may not achieve all five visits due to the closure of the premises for a number of months to date and for the foreseeable future i would like to clarify that there have been no complaints raised from any persons regarding the premises since the last renewal application and the final question that's come in to us is, does the council have any comment to make on the concerns stated within my letter dated November 28, 2019, in relation to its white ribbon status and my, uh, my community safety concerns? Um, this concern has been addressed on previous years. It is accepted that the council does have white ribbon status. However, for the full council adopted the current statement of licensing policy in November, 2018 which has limited the number of sex establishments within Calderdale to one. This policy will be reviewed again after five years in line with the procedures of reviewing our policies. And that's the end of questions. Thank you for that, Fiona. Um, I'm gonna to go to you members, if uh, if you have any questions before I invite any uh, any of the public speakers in, Councillor Pillai, I'm seeing you first. Chair, thank you very much. Just a question to um, Fiona. I know I was present at the last meeting in January, December time. Um, we went through the normal usual questionings and the processes that is required to license an establishment of this nature. And listening to Fiona, the normal questions that I follow through is that of A, comments from the police in West Yorkshire. There's been none. Two, uh, any complaints that have arrived to the council and the council officers as a result of? And the answer there was none. And the objections has not come through to the office from any other shape or form. Uh, 
The establishment has been there since the early part of 2003. The objectors who are the Women's Center have arrived subsequent to that sometime in June 2003. So taking all those into account, from what I hear from Fiona, can I therefore come to a conclusion that nothing has altered from the last hearing that we had towards the end of last year? That's correct, Councillor. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed, Chair. Thank you for that question. Uh, with no further questions, I think that's uh, it's, it's time for us to, to move on. Do, can, I, can I confirm if there is an objector who is um, who is wishing to speak on that? I appreciate we've been able to answer a lot of questions there. Um, Kirsty, Janet, do we have somebody? Yeah, we do have two um, objectors who wish to speak. I'm just going to reach out to the yeah. chat function um, yeah. just to ask them if they actually still want to address the meeting. For the objectors in attendance, I've just used the chat function, which you may see at the bottom of your screen. If you could just respond and let me know if you still wish to. Right, okay. Okay, we've got a couple of people coming through. If you could just comment yes, because I would like to bring you through and you will be visible on screen. If you do not wish to be seen, you do not have to switch your video on, but I'll promote you now. Chair, you will see that we have uh, Catherine Grice, Chris Green and Angela Everson who are in attendance. If you want to name them each to speak in turn, I think that probably would be the best way forward. Thank you. I've just seen Moira, um, Moira uh, pop in with a yes there, a last, a last minute yes. Um, as we've got a number of speakers, I'd ask that people are, 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 con are conscious of time with the speak, but I do want people to feel free. Um, I'm going to take you in the order that you popped up in my chat, and uh, Chris Green, you were in first with a the, but um, I'll take I'll take that. So, uh, Chris, if you're uh, if, if you wish to, I'll I'll invite you to speak uh, and address the committee first. Mute. Okay, I think I'm. Can you hear me? I can, Chris. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, it's just a point of information, as as far as I'm aware. The council has wide powers to refuse to relicense any pre-existing sex entertainment uh, venue. Um, and the fact that they have held a license in previous years is, is completely irrelevant. Um, now, I, I mean, I do stand to be corrected, but I have this on really quite good legal authority because I, it's not from me, it's from uh, other people who've been up and down the country and the, that's the first point I would make that the council has wide powers to refuse to relicense any pre-existing club. A pre-existing club should not be treated any differently from a new applicant and my second point um, is that our councillors are aware that um, recently the the uh, the sex entertainment venue in uh, Sheffield has um, come up for sale. So they've actually decided to throw the towel in. And that's that's actually because I think, oh, and Sheffield City, City Council have um, been found guilty of their, um, of their PSED responsibilities, their equality law responsibilities. Um, and it's the second time that they've conceded that they were breaching the, their PSED 
public sector equality duty um, laws. So just those two points and I'm, I'm done. Okay, thank you. I'll, uh, I'm gonna actually invite um, Chris, Chris, Chris Riley, our solicitor, to um, to respond to a couple of to a couple of those uh, couple of those points. Uh, I'll take the objectors. I'm not planning to have a response to uh, necessarily everyone from Chris, but there's been a couple of legal points raised, so I'll invite him to comment. Chris, you still, you, Chris, you are still on mute. There you go. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, yep. I can. Yeah. Um, I'll deal with the second point first, which was raised. Sorry, was the object I called Chris? I didn't yes, call his indeed. name. Yes, what was Chris, the I call again? It was Chris, Chris Green. Yeah. White yeah, the second point. Thank you. The second point is quite brief in that um, the anything which happens vis-a-vis -vis Sheffield Council and uh, in SAV there is not part of the consideration. In this meeting, this meeting is a decision in, in respect of policy of what happens in Calderdale. So, Sheffield matters don't concern you, uh, Chair and Councillors. In respect of the um, point which Chris raised about Lasasa having previous uh, licenses granted, because we are dealing here with a renewal. As mentioned, of an of an SAV license, as opposed to a first a first application, I would advise that it's not necessary for an objector to demonstrate that Stoneman has changed since since the license was granted. If that was the position, then the ability, obviously, to produce an intended or or desired result would be much reduced. But you must have due regard to the fact that a license has been previously granted. If you find there's a fact, and I think it's been agreed that uh, it is a fact that there has been no relevant change, then your options in the decision are the same. Grant, refuse, um, or additional conditions. So your options remain unfettered. However, the only difference between renewal and an application is that if you do choose to depart from the reason previously, then you must give reasons for that. Um, that's um, taken from case law or a case involving Oxford City Council in 2014. If the committee or the objector wants the full reference, I, I do have that available for you. Thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, I saw Councillor Pillai indicating, do you want to come in, Councillor Pillai? Yeah, Chair, it's not a question nor an issue. I had difficulty hearing Chris Riley in the early stages when he started yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. And therefore I did miss some of the elements of that. Uh, I just wanted to say there was some uh, signaling problems. I do not know whether it's from my end or whether it was from elsewhere. I spotted that, but it, cle it, but it cleared up. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't then interrupt him. Do you want me to Councillor Pilar? I'll repeat if you want Councillor Pilar. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll take us what I've heard most of it as accepted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Chris Green, for coming and presenting to the committee. I, um, I have, um, I believe it's Catherine, 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 Gry, Catherine Grice next, um, uh -huh. who wishes to address the committee. 
Hi, yeah, I'll try and be quick. Um, so Calderdale's mission statement states that Calderdale aims to be the best borough in the north and to grow the economy, reduce inequalities and build a sustainable future. I'd like to see Calderdale councillors actively working to reduce the inequalities that women face because of the licensing of this venue. The suggestion that the power and control displayed in this lap dancing club, where men have the power to pay for the sexual objectification of women, doesn't spill out onto the streets of Halifax and affect our crime statistics and women's lives is laughable. It does. Since the last renewal application, a 26-year-old woman was murdered on Silver Street. Please, to, uh, people look to their leaders to set the tone in society. So we're looking to see what you condone. It's not about being prudish, disliking sex, destroying business. It's about making Halifax a place where women have space where they can feel safe, equal, not objectified, controlled or belittled. It's about equality. The House of Commons Women and Equality Co Committee that looked into sexual harassment of women and girls in 2017, 2019, states that it shouldn't be up to local campaigners to force local authorities to make decisions that properly take account of women's safety and gender equality. And the Calderdale Council's 2018 Everybody's Different, Everybody Matters document um, looked to the licensing of sexual entertainment venues, explores all the way that women's inequality is jeopardized by having such venues. It's well worth rereading this document again. It clearly outlines the problems with the licensing of the venue, but then it seemingly ignores them. Coronavirus is opening up the doors of a new world. It's forcing us to look at inequalities and it's forcing the Women's Centre to work harder than ever to address these inequalities. We've got an opportunity to create a world where we would like our families to live in. You should think carefully about its geographical and moral position in this town and be aware of the messages that you're sending to the whole borough by licensing the venue. And that's it. Thank you for that, Catherine. No worries. Thank you for addressing the Khmer. I will, um, I'll now go to Angela, Angela Everson. Um, if you want to address the committee. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Angela Everson, Chief Executive of Women's Centre. First of all, can I um, just uh, concur with what Catherine has just said? Um, I couldn't agree with her any more. And in addition to that, I would like to say, um, which I've already covered in my letter, you know, Calderdale is a, is proud to be a, a um, business improvement district. And yet again, I asked the same question about having this type of business in our town centre. What message is that sending out to new, new businesses who potentially want to come into an area that is actually struggling to bring businesses into the town, particularly around the top end of town and the Silver Street area? That's just a, a comment. Um, my question is about compliance, um, which I, which is the one that was addressed by, by the licensing officer. Thank you for addressing that. My question is, um, you know, five inspections a year. Um, so far, we've only had one, and I understand the reasons why we've only had one. Can you just explain to me, please, the process of the um, the compliance checks? Are they done um, um, anonymously? Um, who conducts them? Uh, I'd like to just understand a little bit more about the process for undertaking those, please. Yeah, of course I can. So we have a community safety enforcement team. It's a team of enforcement officers that sits within the community protection team. Uh, we're a relatively new team. Previously, it was just licensing and we had a specific licensing enforcement function. Um, what basically will happen is throughout the year, there'll be a programme of works um, it will be spot checks on premises, any licensed premise, to be honest, not just um, the sexual entertainment venue. But as I say, we, we committed to five annually, and that is a minimum. Don't get me wrong, that is a minimum. They are unannounced inspections of the premises to which each officer will go out and they will ensure that the conditions of the licenses are being met. Um, and any issues are there would then be taken up with the license holder should they be found. Could, could I ask if the information, that information then comes into the public domain when these licenses um, renewals are being um, put out? It's it's not something that we, we would normally add to the uh, reports and, and pack when we do the renewals. Um, if members wish for us to add that in, then there's no reason why we, we can't put that into the report. 
um, explaining how many times when we've been out and, and what the results were. I do think that that's, in, that's quite significant information, actually, and I do think it would be useful to have that. Um, that's just an observation. Thank you. Thank you. I will just bring in, uh, I'll just bring in Rob and then I'll comment. Councillor Holden. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for um, being a couple of minutes late this evening. I technology problems. Um, I just want to go back to uh, a comment that um, that Catherine Grice made, uh, referencing a murder in in Halifax, and as and as tragic tragic as it was, I didn't know there was any connection between that and and the lap dancing bar. As far as I was to understand it. That was an altercation between uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend that went tragically wrong. Um, just want to make sure that we are just dealing with facts regarding this premise rather than um, the wider wider issues. Can I respond to that or not? Please, please do please do respond, Catherine. But I don't no, my, to... my main point regarding that was the fact that um, the power and control displayed in um that licensing club is spilling out onto our streets and the increase in domestic violence since the last application year on year on year we're just seeing increases so you're saying nothing's changed and we're seeing violence on the streets we're seeing increase in domestic violence and that's the point i was making i wasn't saying the murder happened there or but i'm just saying that it is having an effect thank you um, Councillor Carter, did I um, did I see you indicating? Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's going on from what Catherine said, really, and I would like to ask the legal uh, our, our solicitor. Um, Catherine has, has indicated when she spoke that. Um, uh, we as, a, we as a committee and we as people should look at ourselves when it comes to uh, granting this license. I, I just want to clarify um, the legal issues. I, whilst uh, I, I am aware that our personal views or moral views or anything like that cannot be brought into a decision making process that we might make tonight. And the legal, the legal elements of what we are allowed to refuse on are, are very minimal. Can we just clarify what those legal bits are again? Because I think it's important that that um, people do understand that uh, there are certain things that we can and cannot do. Thank you, Councillor. Um, in answer to that, um, I'm grateful to Fiona for um, covering all of the criteria in the opening address. Um, you can consider um, matters from the objectors unless they're specifically ex excluded. Um, and you rightfully say that um, moral grounds and values are not to be considered. Now, I don't think those have been uh, restricted to here. It's on a point of law, it's simply a case of balancing all of the objections. A key point is whether or not, and in this case there hasn't been um, objections by the key authority, the, the key responsible authority, which is West Yorkshire Police. So you can consider the objection raised in the facts, but it has to be all put into the equation and you have to make a factual decision as to if and how much the tragic incident and the violence is linked Chair, can I just come back on that? Is that yeah. okay? Um, 
So the other comments that be made about the murder, which was a very sad, a very sad event, um, anybody will recognise that. The increase in domestic violence or, um, or domestic abuse, all that would be taken into consideration. I, I, I would hope, right, with the police, um, when the police look at it, as to whether that, whether in their opinion, any of that is in, is being impacted. Um, when they come to make a decision whether they have objections or no objections. They won't take that into consideration. Yeah. All right. Um, Angela, I will uh, take away what you've said about the complaints. Sorry, the complaint. yes, please. We, won't be, we won't be able to produce the reports, obviously, for this one, but I no. will take that in, in me and Fiona. You, Sorry, you I, 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 was on, I, was, I was on mute and I... Somebody took me off mute and I don't know why, so sorry. No problem, but we'll, I'll take that away and then we'll, we can have a further conversation uh, at a future point. Okay, I have, um, I've still got Moira um, left as our uh, final speaker. Moira, if you want to uh, um, join us. Moira. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, can you hear me? Sorry. That that is, that is better. There was some there was some static coming through at first, but yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, right. Well, I won't repeat what Catherine and Angela have said, and obviously I agree with them because we see it all the time. I mean, I think what we're trying to say, and perhaps not not getting that across, is this isn't about moral objections. It's just about safety. This is about context. It's about climate. And the climate of domestic violence and domestic abuse is bad. It's bad out there. Even the government have recognised this, that the lockdowns contributed even more to it. Uh, the, the objectification of women, which means you can just knock them about. And they produced extra funds for that so that we can go out and pick up some of the pieces. But what I also wanted to say was that when you say there's been no change, there has been a change. You actually now know, you know that a judge at Wakefield Magistrate Court granted the forfeiture of £117,000 from this man. You know that. So any idea that there's no history, no record, clean DBS, okay, that's fine. But you know that, and that's a change in what you knew last year, and that's a new fact. And I would like to think it's been properly considered, and thanks. Thank you, Moira. Chris, I'll, uh, I'll ask you to, uh, to to comment on that last point around the, uh, the sort of declarations about being a fit and proper person. Thank you, Chair. The points about the um, alleged money laundering matters were raised previously, and it was confirmed at the last application that, as here, we have not in the mission from West Yorkshire Police. Uh, there's no objection from the police and we have a clear DBS. Um, so I can't identify what has changed. If this has been addressed previously and confirmed by DBS, Police National Computer, check that. The, the, the applicant hasn't got any convictions, then I don't see that from a point of law and procedure that outside information, which is not through the key responsible authority, can change that. Okay. Thank you. I think we yeah, have to reply. Sorry. 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 Do it briefly, Myra, and then I'm going to move yeah, on. I will do it briefly. Yeah. No, all I'm saying is this is official information from the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. It's official information. And whether or not it affected the DBS or whether or not it's inspired, the point is that this man had £117 confiscated under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Therefore, a judge in Wakefield Court felt that there was enough evidence to take that money away. That's all I'm saying. So please think. Okay. Thank you, Myra. Um, Fiona or someone else in the team, can you confirm that West Yorkshire Police were, were consulted and they've just not sent anything back? Or I can confirm they were consulted, yes. 
and we've had no objections from them. Oh, okay. Councillor Carr? You, you need to go off mute first, Councillor. It'll get second and eventually. All right. I know it's terrible, isn't it? Getting used to this. Um, can I just clarify that West Yorkshire Police and the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office are two separate entities? And I would have thought that in these instances that the Police and Crime Commissioner's Office was also consulted, as well as West Yorkshire Police, because it might not be it might not be something that would would need to go on a DBS certificate, but nevertheless, could be something that the Police and Crime Commissioner has um, made a decision about. And I am somewhat surprised that we've not consulted both both areas when they are two separate entities. Shall I respond? Please yeah, the, 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 for the, uh, as a responsible authority, it's just West Yorkshire Police that we consult. We do not have to consult any other bodies. Okay. I'm going to come back then, so that if there is any issues around surrounding the Police and Crown Commissioner's Office and any action taken there, then that is that that cannot be taken into consideration then, or it cannot be requested. It, it's a bit bizarre, somehow, I think. Uh, I, I if this information, that if this information can... that we've just been given is correct, then how can we how can we how do we know that whether it's right or wrong? It, it certainly impacts on your on your decision making abilities. I presume the police and crime commissioner's office wouldn't be able to keep um, files on individuals though for for, for data protection reasons, and it it did presumably steer clear of of making comments on such things. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on. On chair but, the um, the <laughs> threshold. Of investigation as per the policy and general procedure is that the, the the local police force have the access to um criminal database uh, police national computer etc so the threshold of investigation is with the police um, and so beyond that, and investigate every possible allegation. So the if the checks are made with the police and DBS, and they are returned as clear, then it is deemed that the council have made sufficient investigation. Okay. Councillor Pillai, uh, I saw your hand as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, just coming back on the issues between the West Yorkshire Police and that of the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. As a sitting magistrate, I can verify and say that all records appear on each individual through the Police National Database. And the DBS papers are linked to the Police National Database. And therefore, there's no reason why we need to consult the Police and Crime Commissioner because there are two different entities. The police force is responsible for operational matters. And the Crime and uh, Police Commissioner is very much a policy making body. Uh, if I may be right, I stand to be corrected. But that is how I understand. And therefore, from my experience, if there is any pre-cons that an individual has, will will appear on the papers in front of me as a magistrate, and um, therefore it then reflects on the DBS papers. And to my best of my knowledge, I don't think this has been the case. And as Fiona has already alluded, that we've got a clean paper of a DBS check, and therefore that fulfills the requirements for our reason for meeting this evening. Okay, thank you, Councillor Pillai. Um, and thank you to all the objectors who've, uh, who've addressed the, uh, the committee. Um, I would ask Kirsty to uh, um, allow some of our panellists to, to leave um, and uh, allow the applicant and applicant's agent um, to come forward and address the committee. I don't know if you both wish to address the committee or if uh, 
um, if, if, if one of you is going to be making a representation, but I'll, I'll leave you to uh, um, speak as and when you're, uh, you're unlocked to speak. Councillor, Mr. Ware is signalling to speak, if that's okay. Yeah, I am. Mr. Ware, if you're ready, please do. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, thank you. Um, can, I, can I just say well done for uh, setting these systems up? We're entering into a new world. It's very odd talking to you from my living room, but uh, that's the world we live in now. So uh, thank you very much for accommodating us by way of this virtual uh, hearing. I, I hope that you'll find that the case outline that I sent in was helpful and may shorten some of the time that's needed in this case. I've certainly found in other hearings it's been useful um, to send a case outline uh, to try and drill down into what I see as being the, the key issues here. And it's very helpful that the objectors have gone first, those have re raised representations so that I can deal with the issues that have been brought up uh, as well. So I'm not gonna read out the document. You've got the document in, 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 in being circulated so you can see that um, in clear terms. I think for me, having been involved from when the uh, renewal was initially refused in 2018 and then becoming involved in this case, the chronology is an important feature which has been stressed for you again this evening. So uh, I think it's important to note that it, it, it's been a situation that these premises have been licensed since 2002, operated since 2003, under whatever the licensing regime was at that time. And there's never been a negative suggestion from the police or other responsible authorities when judging it against the statutory tests. And that's clearly an important starting point when you come to consider whether you should renew this license uh, again uh, today. I do think that the minutes of last year's meeting are important and I've attached those to my notes so you can see why the authority having remitted the case back to themselves last year decided um, with a, a differently constituted committee but some of you uh, present last year to grant the license and resolved the three reasons why. Uh, I've set out the law at uh, paragraphs 14 onwards in my note, uh, and, and I think uh, Chris has already helped you on that. Not, none of the, just of the mandatory grounds, so the grounds in which you must refuse the renewal are relevant to today's hearing, uh, but two of the discretionary grounds have been engaged by presentations that have been made by the uh, people who've written in. That's obviously the suitability of the applicant and um, uh, paragraph uh, 2A, 3A, sorry, and 3D, the suitability of the locality. Now, can I just touch upon the case law that Chris was talking to you about? That's the, um, the, the case of Thompson against Oxford City Council. Now, that was a case in relation to some premises in Oxford, which fell for their license to be renewed. And from one year to the next, there had been significant changes in the vicinity of the premises, which impacted on the local policies. The local policy in that area was quite clear in relation to how the locality was defined, and there'd been significant changes. And the Court of Appeal in Thompson said uh, that in those circumstances, a licensing committee could look at what the previous year's committee had done in granting and if they give reasons why there were changes and differences from the previous year, then they weren't bound by the previous year's committee. But the most important thing is that in the case of Thompson, Court of Appeal decision, obviously, which binds all of us uh, in its uh, it legal principles, there had been significant changes in the vicinity of the premises. And that's not the case here. We, we don't have a situation um, with this renewal where there have been changes in the vicinity of the premises. So it's a very different set of circumstances than the Court of Appeal was looking at in the case of Thompson. 
Now, I, I've put what I think are the relevant sections of your own statement of licensing policy for sex establishments in it, paragraph 15 and 16, because I do think they are important. One needs to look at the chronology. So uh, having operated these premises since 2003, uh, my clients applied for the SEV license when it was adopted in 2010, when you as a, an authority adopted the, um, uh, the changes which brought in the changes to the Local Government Miscellaneous Provisions Act, and the license has been renewed since then. In 2018, and you can see from paragraph 15 of my note, you did what all strong responsible authorities did. You went out to significant public consultation. You can see the bullet points there as to who you consulted on when you brought in the policy in 2018. So it was a compelling, well-structured and well-organized consultation process. And at the end of that consultation process, the authority deemed, and this was obviously passed by you as an authority once it went in front of the licensing authority, that there would be one and one only SEV license granted, and it would be for Club La Salsa. So having been operating since 2003, granted it's SEV for the first time in 2010, you went on to go through this policy um, drafting and the license was um, uh, deemed as being the appropriate um, venue to be the one license that's granted. And then when you look at the reasons as to why that was renewed last year in relation to the location grounds, it's because the premises are located within the town center area containing commercial premises and other late night venues. And the premises had been there since 2002 and the character of the locality had not changed in the last 14 years. I think it would be, in my respectful submissions from a lawyer's perspective, it would be wrong to refuse to renew on the location grounds this year because nothing has changed. There's no evidence that's before you that there's been a change to the locality. And I know Chris will help you with the leading case on this, which is the Thwaites decision. And in that case, Mrs. Justice Richards, who was the, um, the judge who sat on that case, said that there needs to be real evidence to form a decision. And there's no real evidence, as Mrs. Justice Richards talks about, that there has been any change in the location, the locality, uh, for that refusal to be deemed as being fair and lawful under the locality uh, heading, discretionary heading. And I've just touched on the Home Office guidance at my paragraph 17 because that document was circulated. That point's um, highlighted in what the um, Secretary of State says in the guidance on sexual entertainment venues. Once you've found what is your appropriate um, local locality, there really needs against that backdrop, against your own policy backdrop and against the Thompson case to have been a change in the locality for it to be a fair and reasonable decision to um, not renew the license, to exercise your discretion to refuse the renewal on the locality ground. In relation to the um, fitness and propriety, the suitability ground, I'll just make some submissions if I may on that. Um, I really don't think it would be sustainable to suggest that there is a reason to refuse on the suitability of this operator because there was a murder in um, the area last year. Uh, I'm not trying to diminish that, obviously, but the relevance to these premises is what you need to adjudicate on when determining to exercise your discretion to refuse the renewal. And there is nothing to suggest there's any link to these premises or this operator, uh, nor is there in relation to some of the other issues that have been raised in relation to um, safety, domestic abuse. Again, it has to be judged on real evidence as per the Thwaites decision, and there is no evidence to suggest that that's the case. What we do have is a, a situation, as I understand it, the police uh, have also inspected the premises along with the local authority, 
and there have been inspections this year you've heard that they are compliance audits and there is nothing negative that's been brought forward by the police in relation to the suitability of these premises with this operator to continue trading there, there is a massive difference between the responsible authority that's created in the act and the police and crime commissioner and i've just read the email that went back from the police and crime commissioner back to the person who made the representations we went through this in significant detail in front of the committee last year and what the situation was was that some money was seized from this family as a result of some tax issues what's happened in relation that's happened since these premises of trading the police have deemed that in the circumstances that they are not directly relevant to the operation of these premises we went through as i said this in great detail last year the important thing is that the dbs check shows that there are no relevant convictions against my client he's got a clean bill of health no convictions and the police as your responsible authority in licensing terms are very comfortable that you having deemed that there should be one license it's at these premises that he's a suitable person to operate um, those premises so uh, again the the issues that are raised in relation to domestic abuse and people's safety um, what is important is that there it's been confirmed to you that there's been no complaints at all during the year and this is the what happens with an awful lot of these uh, renewal hearings for SEVs, that, that there is a, a small and vocal minority of people who, who come out and do not want them to happen. But it, you as, a, as, as an authority have gone through the right processes in determining what your policy is. These premises are deemed to be uh, in the right place in the nighttime economy as part of your policy decision. And really, it's a policy ground that people are objecting again today. And, it, and, it, and it, as you've heard from, I think, Fiona, the policy will be up for um, a, a review. And, and that's really where a lot of these considerations should be directed, uh, not at the um, operator of these premises in relation to um, the locality and his suitability to run the premises. I, I'll shut up now by saying, these are lawful premises, they're licensed, they're, they're legal by a, a, an act of parliament. This operator's traded here since 2002. He's been right the way through your consultation process and there has been annual renewals where there haven't been uh, difficulties. I, I, I've put in last year's uh, decision and most importantly, there's been no complaints directed at the premises since then and there's been a clean bill of health with compliance audits at the premises. Uh, so those are the points that I would like to amplify, but my detailed note, I hope is helpful uh, in giving you a steer as to why uh, in relation to the discretionary tests, this license should be renewed this evening. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Ware, for your comments and for the uh, for sending the case, uh, the case outline in advance. I did find that helpful personally. Um, members, do we have any uh, question to the uh, applicant's agent? Scrolling through to see if I can see you because I can't see you all at the same time. Okay, can, can I just confirm with the uh, with the applicant whether you wish to speak or are you happy that your agent's covered it? Yeah, you're happy? Okay, all right, great, thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Ware. Okay then, members, I will... Um, invite people to uh, to make comments and um, put forward motions um if people would care to indicate i've got you first councillor pili councillor pili as a one thank you <clears throat> thank you chair um as i uh, made comments when fiona presented her evidence to begin with and the reasons why the application is being considered today and following on from the reasons that were presented sometime in November, December of last year, and hearing today from all parties concerned, and also from the defendant's solicitor, 
who has outlined the case very well with evidence and also from previous um, hearings and sittings and case laws. I am going to say that we as a committee today have got no justifiable reason to refuse this application. And therefore I will move a motion suggesting that panel members consider that this application be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pillai. Councillor Clark, I've got you next, and then I've seen you, Councillor Holden. Thank you, Chair. I, th I think what we've got to do, um, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Um, right, okay. What we've got to consider is, is all the legal um, points and all the discretionary and mandatory points, which, as Chris Pillai says, um, we can't really refuse. But I think we, what we're asking is we will be allowing female sub subordination. We will be allowing male dominance and, and objectification of women. Uh, and I think what we have to consider is when we do the review that we have zero SEVs. Um, that's not a move or a motion or anything. It's, it's just my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, I've got Councillor Holden and Councillor Gallagher. What I would say in, in, in sort of following on to that, every year this is a very difficult decision. Um, we all in our own ways get elected for the values that we hold and it's very difficult to be put in a, in a situation where to an extent you may meant to put those values in suspense um, which is very challenging because every decision is made through um, is made through that prism of our of our values. Um, but on this one, any any decision we make um, has to stand up in law as well as well as in the in the eyes of our values. And I think that important distinction you've made there about our role as um, decision makers in terms of following through policy and law. Um, and then our role in terms of as, as policy makers, um, where, we, where we make a policy, policy decision overall on, on, on how, how we want the borough to, to be. Um, Councillor Holden, then I've got Councillor Gallagher, and then I've seen Councillor um, Pilai. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to second the uh, motion put forward by Councillor Pilai. Um, and it really it covers the points that you've already covered you know, regardless of um, our own personal opinions or, or moral standards or, or, or anything, we've got to follow policy and we've got to make sure that any decision we make tonight stand, will stand in the court of law if it's challenged. Um, and which is the reason why I'm, I'm happy to second the, uh, the policy. And, and, and yeah, let's, let's re at, the re at the review of the policy, let's, let's, open it up and, and and examine how we how we can adjust the policy to suit Calderdale's ambitions. But that's not for us to do tonight. Tonight it's to make a decision based on the policy that's in place in Calderdale. And as far as I can see, everything is being met by the applicant. Thank you, Councillor Holden, Councillor Gallagher. Got to stop messing about with this. Can everybody hear me? Hi, it's okay. just a comment. Can you hear me, Dan? Okay, just a comment, really. Uh, I mean, we're talking at length about the applicant. However, you know, I'd like to talk about the people that are employed there, especially, you know, we're talking about the dancers, the self employed. This is an industry that they choose, choose to go into, you know, and they take then that responsibility for whatever business that they want to go into. So I have to agree with uh, Councillor Pillai and Councillor Holden. And just for the record, as a, a trade union member, we have um, members of the sex industry within our trade unions, and they're the ones that have the voice and they're the ones that take that responsibility in terms of safety and what they what is good for them. So. Yes, uh, I have to agree with uh, Councillor Holden uh, and Councillor Pillai. 
Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Um, Councillor Pillai, I had you, and I think you might be the final word from the committee, or if no one else is indicating. Right. Thank you, Chair. I totally appreciate Angie's comments because I know we all have considered the applicants and the applicant's case and the representative that's been laying out the facts in front of us. And I think Angie has put a good, good point there, which I appreciate that we all need to take into account. Because end of the day, they are also participants and they are also involved in a business that they so choose. They have not been forced into it. Having said that, Chair, all I need to say is, look, um, we, we are looking at all the positive reasons as to why an application ought to be granted according to the rules of the council policies and how Fiona has um, eluded to us this morning or this afternoon or this evening rather, for that matter. And I would dread to see if for whatever reason, we as a group of the licensing and regulatory body were to come to a wrong conclusion and to attract a judicial review. And that would be very, very awkward and difficult for the council. And therefore I urge all members to look at the facts in the cold light of day and to take away personal issues and moral values and the rest of it, and just look at the facts that's in front of us and follow the evidence that's been laid and therefore, I move again to support me in the proposal that's been seconded by Councillor um, Holden, and as Angie has also alluded to us this evening. So I urge everybody to reconsider away from the moral values and away, but look at the facts and look at the issues and look at the evidence and look at what the police have said and look at what the evidence that Fiona has laid that her officers who have been to investigate this place on a regular basis, albeit that we are under COVID-19 um, uh, considerations, there has been no action taking place. So therefore, I, I move again, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Peel. I, I am doing a last flick through to see if we have anybody indicating. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to take us through into the vote in just a minute. Thank you for everyone who's contributed to the debate, um, objectors, um, uh, to Mr. Wu, the applicant's agent, and to the uh, committee support and councillors who, who, who've been here. This is a difficult issue. There are very troubling um, issues morally for a lot of people, and it is on both sides, as, as Councillor Gallagher has said, and there's been many a time when the focus of this um, application renewal has actually been around conditions and around improving the safety of of people working in there whilst accepting the existence of, of a club that um, not everyone necessarily agrees with. Um, but we have a, we have a motion um, which is to, um, to accept the renewal of this licence. Um, will all those in favour please uh, raise your hand. And um, uh, any against? I'll take if anybody's hand didn't move as an abstention. Yes, Councillor Clark. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that motion is um, carried and the uh, application has been approved for renewal. And that brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, uh, as I said, thank you everyone for uh, contributing and I look forward to seeing you all for our uh, next meeting or um, and even better when I can see you all in the flesh. Take care, everyone. Take care, everybody. Thank Councilor you, Chair. Pilar, do you want to have a question before we're ending? Go on. Not a question, Chair, just to say, under the well, difficult circumstances being virtual, I thank you very much for coping with everybody that you've had to face on that front, and very well done. Oh, it's the nicest we've ever been. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. All right, all right. Lovely to thank see you, you all. Chair. All right, take care.